I'm introducing Dr. Jeff Waring. Waring. Waring is the he is the director of the Center of Business, Entrepreneurship, and Tourism, or the CBT for CBET for short, as well as an assistant professor of entrepreneurship and management in the School of Business at the Black Hill State University. Uh, Jeff currently teaches the Introduction to Entrepreneurship, Small Business Management, and Business Plan Writing seminar courses as integral in the development of entrepreneurship-focused activities in the area. Jeff's hobbies include perpetually f fishing in, oh, finishing his basement, long road trips, and taking his wife, and seven kids, and St. Bernard to explore the outdoors. Okay, thank you. Um, so today we are talking, it, it's, I call this talk The Reluctant Celebrity, and it's a discussion about the Crazy Horse Memorial. And so how many of you here have been to the Crazy Horse Memorial? Okay, um, if you haven't, you should go because it's really awesome and it's like just a couple minutes up the road. So um, anyhow, that's what we're talking about now. Uh, I, used, I like to say this is the early days of the memorial because we're gonna start the discussion about 1947 and end it in like 50. So it's like this three year period right at the beginning of the memorial. Okay. And so uh, a lot of what is there now uh, was just kind of a vision. And so it's really how did that vision begin? Um, Richard, do you have the ability to put up the slide? Um, how do you do that? Okay. So here's the question. You, you know what the memorial looks like now, right? And so you see that image of, you see that image where it's a, it's a face on the mountain, right? But that's actually a pretty new occurrence. And so for most of the time that the memorial has been here uh, and being built, there was really not much for you to see. Right? And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about. So where did it start? So what's the history? And I, uh, I don't know if anybody got the packets. I forgot to tell you. Davin, do you want to hand out the, the little packets there? So in here, uh, this is a case study I wrote about the initial interactions between uh, Chief Henry Standing Bear, who had the idea to build a memorial to Crazy Horse, and Korchok Trukovsky, who was the artist involved. So you can see an image of both of them right there. Um, and the first letter, which was written actually from Standing Bear before he had any, any interaction with Korchok, and it read, you know, Dear Sir, according to a newspaper notice, I note you have won honors at the New York World's Fair in Sculpture. So he knew nothing about him, and yet he reached out and said, hey, will you come here? Right? Will you come and make this memorial? Um, to honor Chief Henry Standing Bear. It, it said, you know, a number of my fellow chiefs and I are interested in finding some sculptor who can carve a head of an Indian chief who was killed many years ago. And so this was the initial letter. From this, Korchak came and he visited the Pine, uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, right? And he got to know the people. And he then said, uh, he said, you know, the Indians received a dirty deal from the white men. The more I study their history, their traditions, and their legends, the more I am convinced that we, the white men, must do something to honor their name. So Korchak came, and he was an outsider from Boston, right? But he came and he bought into this idea that we need to honor the culture of the native people. This is really important, right? That he actually believed in this, um, this ideal behind the Memorial Foundation. Um, the problem is, what did he have? Right, so he had a mountain, and that was it. Right, so he had searched around, and and Korchok and Stanley Bear went around uh, the Black Hills and tried to find an area that you know they could make this memorial, and this is what they had. It actually was less than this, right? Because here you can see he had already painted uh, kind of an outline on the mountain, but for you know years, this is all there was. Okay, so what do you need if you want to if you want to carve the largest sculpture? In the entire world, what is it that you need? Yeah, you need money, right? And a lot of money, okay? So you go and, and you want to tell people, hey, come here, look at this mountain, and give me money. Okay, how many people are going to pay to want to see this mountain? Not too many, right? I mean, that, that's the problem, right? If you're trying to you know, do something and raise money, um, through tourism, at least, right? You need something that's worth seeing. And in the eyes, and, and millions of people, 
to you know, make it worth seeing for millions of people. And this wasn't it. And so what's the solution? What? Okay, so you get started and, and to make some progress, right? Which can work initially, but the problem is you're talking decades and decades, right? So you know this is the 1940s, and you know Korchak was you know, was overly you know, like he had this huge vision that he thought I can get this done in 30 years, okay? I mean that's a little like crazy ambitious, right? But can you get people for 30 years to come and see like a mountain that's nothing there? Probably not. Right? So what ended up happening is Korchak became the crazy man on crazy horse. So that was a phrase that the AP uh, came up with to describe this project. It's the crazy man on crazy horse. Right? And so this was, I say, the start of Korchak's celebrity, but he actually was a celebrity before this, right? Because he was a famous artist who won at the New York Fair, and that's how Standing Bear knew about him. Right? But this was his real celebrity related to the project. He's this crazy man. And so uh, some of the, the articles, you know, this was an interview from somebody that knew him from Boston, from his previous project, and said, you know, he is, although he would throw a mallet at you if you called him one to his face, a genius, almost a throwback to the giants of the old world's glorious renaissance. Only a rash man would say that Korchak Zhukovsky, the orphan boy from Boston, won't see it through, God willing, to completion. Okay? So you read this type of statement, and what is the focus? Is the focus on honoring the native people? No, not at all, right? The focus is on Korchak and you know that he is an artist who can do big things. Right? And if you look through his history, I mean he had done some amazing things in terms of you know sculptures that you know were being fought against politically, and yet he was able to negotiate them through, and you know, he pulled off some great things. But here, this is a focus on him, right? And at the same time, you start to see these other uh, articles coming in Time Magazine, Life Magazine, The New Yorker. They all started doing pieces focusing on Korchok. Okay? Uh, the Joe Palooka um, comic strip, right, which was in 900 newspapers across the country, started including this crazy man on crazy horse in their, in their cartoons. Okay, which I think it's funny, right? You've got a, a boxer who fights Nazis, right? Is a cartoon series. And, you know, they start talking about this guy who's carving a mountain, which seems out of place, but it's, it's boosting the celebrity status of Korchok. Okay? And as happens today, right? Today, when somebody becomes a celebrity, um, you know, this controversy arises. And the controversy, we say, you know, all, no, no press is bad press, right? Starts to make him even more of a celebrity. So the biggest controversy I've read about, um, it was between uh, Mrs. Borglum, so you know Goodson Borglum carved Mount Rushmore, right? And so between his wife and um, <clears throat> and Korchok, right? And so this idea that there was some conflict between them, and they didn't have social media at the time, so they wrote letters back and forth to each other in the mag uh, in the newspaper. So they'd include these letters in the newspaper. And it was actually between Mrs. Borglum and, and Mrs. Joukowsky, so Dorothy, uh, typically. So they'd go back and forth where you know she'd say, Mr. Joukowsky never assisted my husband in any way, right? So there's this claim that Korchak had assisted on uh, Mount Rushmore. He was only there for a few days. But he was there helping for a few days. And so Mrs. Borglum says, no, he was never there. That's all a lie. He's making it all up. But instead of going back and forth, you know, like normal civilized people typically would, um, they do it on the social media of the day, which is the newspaper, right? And so that builds this up, right? This builds the celebrity, and at the same time, distracts the focus away from the actual mission of the memorial. Make sense? So, so I, I like to say this is the reluctant celebrity, right? So Korchak was accepting of this because he knew that it was necessary to have this celebrity status because they needed something to come and see. Because the tourists start coming at this point. Because, hey, they want to see this crazy man on crazy horse that's in the newspapers all over the country. But, and, and so he accepts that because they need the money. But on the other hand, um, that's not why he's doing it, right? He's doing it because he wants to support these native people. And so this is, this is the reluctance, right? So next we have Standing Bear. So, you know, who is Chief Henry Standing Bear? Okay. So he had this idea that he wants to honor 
his people, right? And specifically, he mentions, you know, he wants to honor Crazy Horse, who was a relative of his, okay? Because in the culture, you can only do a memorial like this if it's a, if it's a direct relative. So that's why Standing Bear came up with this. It's like, hey, this is a, a great man that we can honor, and at the same time, honor all of my people, okay? So it's a, it's a great idea. Uh, the problem is he wasn't living here. So for him to be involved was difficult. Okay? And so there was this, you know, you would think, hey, we need a standing bear of the celebrity, right? We don't want the focus to be on Korchak. Nobody wants the focus to be on Korchak. So let's make standing bear celebrity. So Dorothy would make comments uh, in the letters. So I've been reading through all these personal letters back and forth. She said, you know, um, we need you here. The project would be better for your presence on the site. The principal thing is that you are a part of the Crazy Horse Memorial Project and a very important part. You are needed here, right? This is what was needed. Um, she made comments like, you know, Korchak wants me to ask you if you would please send letters to the New York Herald Tribune and to the Mitchell Daily Republic, explain that the vision and the desire to memorialize one of the great men of the Sioux Nation came from you. So not only did they want to draw him here, but they wanted him to be in the forefront of the press, right? They didn't want the press to constantly be going to Korchak, right? They wanted them to be focusing on Henry Standing Bear. And a lot of this was because of the contention, right? So, I mean, having a white man uh, representing, like, hey, we're going to help the Native people, right? I mean, that doesn't look, it doesn't look great, right? Uh, we have that issue right now where you see, you know, it, you know these causes, like, uh, I was actually just reading today about how uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, is, you know, being called out because he is supporting, you know, women in STEM. And how, how can a, you know, how can a man understand the struggles of a, of a woman who's trying to get into the STEM field, right? I think it was the same type of issue going on here where, <clears throat> you know, how can this, this white man from Boston, right, understand the trials that the Native people have gone through? And so they're like, well, let's stick Standing Bear there, and he can be the one that the press focuses on. Um, which, you know, Standing Bear did, he did try to help, right? So he stepped in. And he would say, okay, the idea was conceived by me, and I insistently begged the sculptor to study and advise me as to the possibility of a, uh, it should be monument, to promote the project, and for what assistance he might wish to give. So he, he acknowledged to the press repeatedly, this was my idea, okay? So he would do that, okay? The problem is um, getting him here, right? So getting him to move up here. And so a lot of the letters had comments such as, I shall try to locate myself in customer, er, Custer as soon as possible. I just want you to understand why I've been so much helpless at times, right? So lots of excuses for why he couldn't actually be physically present at the memorial. And this was the problem, right? So him writing the newspaper was one thing, but when the press came out, uh, Standing Bear wasn't available. And so they went to Korchok. <clears throat> so this is uh, where we can look at the pros and cons. So pros of celebrity, right? So Korchak is a celeb becomes a celebrity and the focus of this project. Right? So what are some of the pros? Yeah, so they're able to bring money in, right? So they needed the, the resources financially to be able to continue the project. Good. What are some other positives? Notoriety. Notoriety for... Okay. Good, so, it, so it, it gets publicity for the project. Good, okay. What would be the major cons of having Korchak be the celebrity? Okay, so it's, it's this idea that like, it makes people question the intention, right? Because of the, maybe the color of his skin, um, maybe does he have alternative motives, right? And, and what is it that's going on? And I think that's a major con, okay? So, good. So the focus became on court chalk. Okay. So this, this is where I think it gets interesting. Right? So <clears throat> all of a sudden, uh, and I say over time, but we're talking in the, over the course of like two years, right? Uh, this contention begins to form between court chalk and standing bear. And I think a lot of it had to do with celebrity, right? So. Uh, one con we mentioned, we didn't mention, right, is how does it affect Standing Bear when he sees Korchak get all of this attention, right? 
I mean, how would you feel if you came up with this idea that was, you know, probably the, the biggest, grandest idea, you know, maybe in the history of the world, right? And then this other guy is getting all of the attention and focus. Can you, can you imagine that feeling? And so I think that was one of the causes of the contention that started to form, okay, from Standing Bear's side, right? He, he probably didn't enjoy that. And then Korchok, on the other hand, you know, was trying to get him here. And so he's getting upset about the fact that this isn't working that he can't get Standing Bear to show up. Okay. And so the intention starts, it goes back and forth. There's lots of letters. You can feel this building between these two individuals. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> big open house, right? So they are, you know, they've started making progress. They've got the plan set, and they're going to officially launch this project. Okay. After three years, it, it's go time. Right? And so, big, you know, big showy event is being planned, okay? And Korchok needs Standing Bear to be there, okay? But he won't commit. He won't commit to coming. He won't commit to coming. And so, what do you do if if you're in in Korchok's position, and you know you you know you cannot go in front of you know all of these politicians and all of this media and stand there alone saying, "Hey, I'm a white man from Boston." I'm going to honor the native people, you know, look at me, look at me, right? You can't do that. So what do you do when you can't get Standing Bear to commit? Okay, you might want to go and just drag him up here, right? Um, that, that wasn't quite possible with the times. What else could you do? Get a stand-in, right? Okay, so he's not the only Native American in the area. I mean, there, there's a lot. Okay? And actually, a, a lot who are probably more influential than he actually is. Okay, so that's exactly what Korchok did. Is he said, you know what, this is an open house. We can have other Native Americans here that we stick in front and center and get them involved in the project and say, hey, look, we're a team. We're all doing this great work together. You know, it doesn't have to be Standing Bear, okay? And so this letter comes after the event. So they have this event, it's a great success, you know, huge publicity, you know, all these, you know, people are, are thrilled about the project now. Even some who have been protesting it for, you know, the last two years all of a sudden get on board, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so in case you're following along, this is on page seven. I've skipped through a lot, so. Um, in January, so the event was in October. In January, he said, uh, Korchok receives a letter from Standing Bear that says, Dear Korchok, since the open house ceremony you had at Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation last two or three weeks ago in October 1949, when you had one Bill Fire Thunder and Ben Black Elk on the program, I felt that I should and in that to warn you once again that in respect for the honor and dignity of the Crazy Horse Memorial, Foundation, and for the respect and honor of the commission back of the project, composed of citizens high in culture and integrity, any Indian or Indians or person or persons employed or used in any activity whatsoever in connection with Crazy Horse Memorial should not be a fit person. It is regrettable that you should have been fallen in the hands of Bill Fire Thunder and Ben Black Elk, who you had on the program. Respectfully, Henry Standing Bear. Okay, does Henry Standing Bear like Bill Fire Thunder and Ben Black Elk? No, right? But they were around, and so Korchok, you know, had them kind of take that place, right? That position. Okay, so here's the big question for you. What do you do? So you're Korchok, right? You've kind of been falling away from, from this other guy, right? And now you try, you're trying to do right, and you know to get the celebrity off of yourself, and you receive this letter. What do you do? You bring them all together and try and make peace. Okay. Anyone else? What would you do? Cut them out completely. Okay. 
Okay, so here's a letter, and it's not included in your packet, but it's, it's my favorite letter. So let me read it to you. <clears throat> so this is a letter that um, Korchak wrote back uh, February 4th, um, so 1950, just so you know about where we are. Henry Standing Bear, I am in receipt of your letter of January 31st, 1950, in which you enclose a copy of a letter which you wrote to me, dated 19, or October 1949, but which you say was mislaid. It is with great restraint that I write you an answer to both your letter and your note. You always know something good's coming when he says, with great restraint. <clears throat> I wish to correct a few of your erroneous ideas and statements. First, the open house at Crazy Horse was not held in October, but on September 20th, 1949. Secondly, William Fire Thunder, Congressman Francis Case, Justice J.B. Johnson, the mayors of Rapid City and Custer, and the National Congress of American Indians were all invited. In fact, the whole Black Hills was invited. That is the meaning of open house. Nobody was excluded. You seem to forget, Standing Bear, that Mr. William Fire Thunder is the president of the Pine Ridge Tribal Council, and that this crazy horse memorial is being built for the benefit of all Indians. How irrational it would be for me to exclude an Indian, much less the president of the tribal council, from a program in honor to the Indian people. You go on in your letter to warn me about the honor and dignity of the Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation. What have you done, Standing Bear, to help the honor and dignity of the foundation? It is true that 11 years ago you wrote to me and asked me if I would come out to the Black Hills to carve a portrait of a mountain to your great chief who was killed many years ago. I journeyed to the Pine Ridge Reservation at my own great expense in order to interview you. My love for the story of the Indian people has meant a great deal to me, and I made a promise that I would build this memorial. You too made a promise, Standing Bear, that if I were to come out, to, out here to do this for your people, that you would help me in every way that you could. Now, Standing Bear, I would like to have you tell me what have you ever done to help? Or could you tell me of anything that you have done to help? You seem to always warn me of people whom I should have nothing to do with. But do you ever bring any people here that you do want me to have something to do with? Do you remember last spring when I was sick on my back with a temperature that I begged you to stay and keep your word with me of 10 years standing to stay at Crazy Horse? That I would support you, pay you a salary, take care of you, and in return, all you had to do was talk to the tourists. Do you remember what you said to me standing there? I can tell you. You told me, or rather, you asked me, do you want me to starve at Crazy Horse? That is all the help you have ever given, standing there. That is all. Every letter you have ever written to me, I have kept. Every letter I have written to you, I have kept. Because in the future, I will want the people to know how an Indian by the name of Henry Standing Bear acted towards a man of foreign extraction who came 2,000 miles gave up his way of life, lost his family, his friends, and his fortune in order to keep his word, and how this man, Standing Bear, did nothing of this man but beg for money, beg for recognition, beg for help to, make, to help to be made a great Indian, because he himself could not make himself that. In the annals of Indian remarks, there will be a saying that will go like this. One does not go to a politician for help or to Henry Standing Bear for truth. You will continue to receive notifications of meetings, and it will be your privilege to visit Crazy Horse as a tourist and to bring your friends. But until I have an explanation of your behavior, I will continue as I have in the past to create a memorial to Crazy Horse and to do what you never even dreamt of doing. I will build a museum, university, and hospital for the Indian people of North America. Very truly yours, Korchak. <clears throat> so what's the response? Say, if there's any way to like give the middle finger in an email, that's it, right? I mean, um, it, it's like one of those mic drop opportunities where he's just saying, this is it, I'm done, you're out. You know, I love that line, you are more than welcome to come as a tourist, right? Even though it's your idea. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so this is the response. 
Okay? And I go through with my students and we talk about, okay, you know, why was Standing Bear necessary in this project? Because right? uh, he was. I mean, for the initial creation, he gave the sense of legitimacy, right? He gave, you know, the resources in terms of the network, in terms of understanding the native culture. I mean, he was a necessary part. But because of, you know, Korchok wasn't getting those resources, uh, he was able to cut them out without any loss, right? And so the personality conflict got to this point and they just dropped it and Korchok was able to bring in these stand-ins, right? So these other Native Americans who could come in and replace them, right? But, <clears throat> so that, that was the end. That's like the end of their relationship. But it was also the beginning of what the memorial has become today, okay? So at the end of that letter, uh, it had this really, really cool statement that I, I think would get missed. Um, but it said, you know, I will continue as I have in the past to create a memorial to Crazy Horse, right, which is still going on, okay, and will probably continue to go on for decades to come. Um, and to do what you have never even dreamt of doing, I will build a museum, university, and hospital for the Indian people of North America. Okay? And so th this, I think, surprises some people. Okay? Because if you go up there, I mean, yes, there's a museum, right? Everybody's seen the museum. It's a pretty cool museum, right? Lots of stuff and beautiful woodwork. <laughs> I, I love the ceilings. I just go there and just look at the ceilings, right? So we think about the museum, but we don't think about the fact that, you know, this idea of a, a university and a hospital. How many of you knew that there's a university at the Crazy Horse site? Okay. And um, that's not a large percentage of the group here, right? And so um, it... it I look at this as almost like a, a third reluctant celebrity, right? But it should be a celebrity. Everybody should know about this, this work that's been done to build this university up there. And it's not known. So that's kind of where I want to go now is this idea of like, okay, so why isn't it known? Um, but first, this is just my favorite quote. This was actually, you know, a few years later. Uh, but this is Korchok explaining what he sees and why he sees the purpose of the memorial now moving forward, right? He says, you know, a piece of sculpture put on view that has for its sole purpose not but a figurement of attraction as its goal is not sufficient. Therefore, although the carving of Crazy Horse will be one of the wonders of the world when it is finished, the ultimate purpose of this gigantic work, besides taking its place in history, is to create a university, a museum, and a medical center for the benefit of the Indian people of our country, so that in this way we may give something to these people who have given us so much. Right? And so this was really his vision. And so if we look back on the conflict between uh, you know, Standing Bear and Korchok, it's possible that you know, the difference in vision was maybe one of the key things that caused that to start. Right? I mean, they were viewing this very differently. And so, um, you know, Standing Bear's view was, hey, we are honoring my people. We're looking at the past and, and recognizing the importance of our history. Whereas Korchok was looking toward the future. And so a very different purpose for everything that was going on up there. And I think that's, it's, it's difficult to reconcile. Right? Um, so, okay, so you know about the memorial, you know about the museum and the cultural center. Uh, some of you, or now you all know about the university and the medical training center, right? And ultimately, this is what it's supposed to look like. And so, you know, what do we have right now? We have this section here, okay, that you've all seen, and, you know, it looks a little bit different, but it looks pretty similar to that, right? Uh, but we don't have, you know, this is all supposed to be a university, a giant university that's going to be on the site someday. And then here's a, a large medical center, okay? And Korchok was very insistent that there would be athletic fields. He was like, like sports is you know, a really important part of your education. So um, <clears throat> we need to get some athletic you know, facilities here down in Rapid City, right? Um, so anyhow, so that, that's the vision that Korchok had. And it's much grander right, than just a, a sculpture. Okay? And honestly, I don't even think Standing Bear was envisioning a sculpture of that size when he proposed it, right? And so it's just the scale, you know, that they're thinking of. Okay. So here's the museum. You've all seen the museum, the cultural center, right? Great place to take. I, I like to take my kids so that they can see how the work is being done with all the crafts, 
Okay? But then the Indian University of North America um, that people don't know about is actually relatively recent. Okay? So uh, Native students have the lowest college enrollment and graduation rate of any minority in the country. Okay? And I mean, it's just, it's abysmal. Okay? I have seen uh, estimates as low as 6%. Um, and it's, I mean, just horrible, right? So, you know, what do you, this is a people that need help. These students need help. So in 2008, the board of directors, um, pushed by Ruth Joukowsky, um, who was Korchak's second wife, uh, decided, hey, we need to make this university portion of Korchak's vision a priority, right? So he had this huge dream. We have to make this a priority and make it happen. And this was just in 2008. Okay? And some people have said to me, you know, she just wanted to see it done before she passed because she was getting old too. Okay? And so, okay, they said, okay, how do we do this? And this is why I think is great is they were deliberate about it and said, we can't do it on our own, right? We have expertise in making giant sculptures but we don't know how to run the university. And so they went out and they solicited proposals for partnerships. They knew somebody had to partner with them. And so they had a bunch of existing universities and other organizations send them proposals of what they could do. And they ultimately went with USD, which I think makes sense, right? So they went with the proposal by USD. And in 2010, so summer of 2010, so two years later, they started up the program and actually had a cohort of students come through that summer. That just blows my mind that in two years, I mean, can you imagine starting a, a university program in two years? <clears throat> it's, it's kind of a crazy thought. Right? Um, to make this happen, obviously needs lots of money. Right? Um, I actually think this was a, a huge, um, a huge positive move because you, know, you tell people, hey, we need more money, more money just to carve a mountain and who wants to keep giving millions of dollars, right? Um, to carve the mountain, but you know, so they get this, you know, twenty bucks here and there from the cars coming in. But if they do something like a university, all of a sudden you can go for big donors, right? So Paul and Muffy, Kristen, um, they gave five million dollars to kick off the program, you know, just right, right away. Um, <coughs> uh, Denny Sanford uh, built the res hall, uh, and so he built the the dorms for the students to stay in. Um, which I think they actually look pretty too because I like the wood, right? And so they were able to get these, these two uh, people to really put in a lot of money just to get it jump started really quick. Uh, they were able to set up, you know, okay, we have a, a campus center, we have classrooms that they could get in and they could just get it started in two years, which is incredible, okay? Uh, so what's the focus? So the focus is really let's prepare these students for success when they get to a, a traditional college. So you know they, they go in and they earn 12 to 14 credits in a summer, just boom, like that. So they take algebra, speech, comp one, um, a college success class, right? So we call that like GS100 at BH. Um, they can take intro to psych, and then they do internships. So I mean, what does that look like? Basically, your first semester of freshman year. And so they can knock out their first semester freshman year, you know, that summer before they start college. Okay. Computers, success strategies, uh, heavy advising, right? Focus is on let's help these students to be successful. And so they have heavy advising that goes through, uh, teach them life skills like etiquette, right? That I think a lot of students now don't get. And... <laughs> There you go. And so that's, that's what they did. They created this program. Right? And I think that it needs to be publicized more. I think we need to get the word out more about this. Um, so far, they've had 189 students complete the program um, and go through a summer program. Uh, they can do 32 freshmen at a time, and then they have six students at a time that come back for a second summer. Okay? And they cap it that way. And they also cap it. They don't want it to be more than 90% Native students because part of it is they want to have this uh, interaction, you know? And so, so that's just how they've arranged it intentionally. Again, it's all intentional. Uh, so far, 83% of the students who have gone through the program are either still in college or have graduated. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's enormous. I mean, if you think about that, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, BH would love it if they could get an 83% percent rate of, of retention with their students. Okay. 
And so I think that's a, a key thing saying, hey, this is a success, right? The student's getting this attention um, and it's helping them be successful. So my last question is, is, it a, is this just a memorial? Is that the point, right? What did Standing Bear want? He wanted a memorial, right? But is that what it's become? Is it just a memorial? No, right? And you know, the, the, the idea that way back in 1950, and there's actually some hints even before that, but in, as early as 1950, Korchuk was saying, no, this is not a memorial. It's going to have a museum. It's going to have a university. It's going to have a, a medical center on the site. Right? Um, that's important for us to recognize, that it's not just a memorial. And we forget that when we're just driving down the highway and we pass it. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. So a, a lot of that had to do with, um, so what, the question was why not accept government funding? So a lot of people don't know that Mount Rushmore was never finished. And that was largely because the government stepped in and said, hey, we don't want to spend any more money. We're going to stop it at this point in time. Right? And so Mount Rushmore is like half done. And um, it's really kind of sad <laughs> in my mind. And so uh, Korchok didn't want that to happen. So that was part of it. The other part is this belief that, hey, the US government screwed over the native people. And so we don't want to have them involved at all uh, in this project. Um, because you know, it doesn't make sense to let them take some of the credit when they're, you know, they've done so much ill to these people. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> no, they actually are working on it constantly. Yep, so they are up there working on it all the time. Um, and it, they you don't see most of what they're doing. You know, because it's like, okay, we're doing this rough carving. And that's actually what was happening for most of the time that Korchak was alive. Okay? So he insisted that the way to do the memorial was to rough cut the whole thing and then do all the finishing work. Okay? <clears throat> but the problem is, right, that doesn't draw the tourists. And so when Korchak passed away, um, his wife Ruth said, we are going to finish the face. And so they cranked out the face and got that done. Okay? And it took about 10 years. And so she just passed away two years ago. And so now they're going through again and they're saying, okay, you know, we got the face done and then we went back to rough cutting. Well, now we have to show the progress again. And so now they've been making this huge effort over the last year to finish the finger. And so you can see how you can actually make out a finger, you know, that he's pointing with right now. And they say in the, in the next 10 years, you'll be able to see like the whole arm, you know, build out like that. So in the next 10 years, it'll be a big difference. And you know, it's one of those things we, you know, that we're always working, right? They're always working, but yet when something happens and they have to prove to the public that progress is being made, that's when you start to see it. Does, does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> if you follow on Facebook, it's interesting. They're always bragging about the progress on Facebook, but for someone who's, you know, for a normal person, we look at it and it's like, well, you just drilled some holes, right? And it's like, it's the big progress for the week. You drilled some holes. But to them, it's, hey, we've drilled these holes strategically so we can, you know, chip away whatever chunk. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. I was here in 71, and I'm sure Rich was born here, and others, but there was just an L. It was, it was just an L. And so when I come back 44 years later, I'm pretty impressed. Yeah. You know? And uh, uh, since Ruth passed away, I think a board of directors has taken over. Yeah, so it's actually, um, there's always been a board, right? Um, but Ruth was really driving it and leading it. And since Ruth has passed away, um, there's three women that now run everything. So there's uh, Monique and Viga, who are two of Ruth and Korchok's daughters. Okay? And then there's uh, Laurie Beckfar, who uh, actually came from USD. She is the one who made the proposal at USD to have the university. And then uh, Ruth begged her to come and take over. 
And so that's, that's what ended up happening is you've got those three women that all work together um, to keep the progress going. And so Monique's really in charge of the construction aspect and, um, and Viga does a lot of the stuff with, I think, the, the financial end in terms of, you know, the, the restaurant and the, you know, those things on site. And then um, Laurie is in charge of university and pretty much everything else. So, yeah. yeah. So how much did, did Standing Bear ever go back after that last letter? I have not found any evidence of him going back. Um, there, there was one more letter between the two where it was kind of like a making peace type of letter. Uh, but Standing Bear actually passed away a couple of years later. And so his health really was, I mean, some of it was excuses about his health, but some of it was real. His health was declining. And so um, he didn't really make it back. The kids actually ended up, you know, making peace later on, and, you know, which is good. And, you know, same thing actually happened with the Borglums. Is once Mrs. Borglum passed, the kids ended up making peace, you know, between those two families too. So, yeah. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. What is the, I guess, the financial makeup of the organization now? Like, what do they get in terms of funding from donations versus commissions versus, I guess, what others? I guess, like, where does their interest come from for, I guess, the monument as well as the entire entity? Yeah, so uh, the monument, like, construction comes primarily through the entrance fees of people coming to visit. And, um, it's it's been that way actually all along, and so when you when you came to visit back then, that's where the money was going. If you came now, and what's interesting is because because of that, the family wasn't taking any of it to survive off of, you now because that was all going to construction. So they've always had other activities that supports the family, and so um, Korchok survived off of um, cutting down timber, and uh, you know doing some mining type activities around the area, right? And um, and also I think some cows and stuff. Now the family survives off of like the restaurant and the gift shop. So that's actually a separate entity um, from the, the actual construction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now the university is is big donations. So that's that's mainly going off of donations right now. Yep. Cool. Other questions? I think it's really neat. I have loved to go down there, and I just go through the archives and read these letters back and forth between these individuals, and um, it's just wonderful. It's like reading a novel that nobody's ever read before, uh, because most of these letters uh, haven't been made open to the public. So that big one that I read uh, from Korchok to Standing Bear, uh, nobody had seen that before. And so I, you know, I found it in the archive. I guess the librarian had seen it. She kind of pointed it out and said, hey, this is a really great letter, right? Uh, but it hadn't been hadn't been known to the public, so. Yeah. Is that on no, I mean it's just, it's one of those things where a lot of them kind of just got put in boxes, I think, and or were given to different individuals. And now, as that generation is passing away, a lot of the stuff is getting willed back to the memorial site, and they have an extensive archive and library down in the basement of the museum. And not many people know about, I mean, a great library, if you want a book that's been written about Native Americans, they probably have it down in that library because that's like a whole huge library of just those type of books. Um, and yeah, nobody knows about it. And they are a little bit, I mean, like these letters, you can't just walk in off the street and say, hey, I'd like to see all these letters. Um, I had to sign a lot of paperwork that went through their lawyers to let me see it, but um, but they're open to it, right? So I proposed this research project, and they were open to letting me go through and you know go through the archives with my little white gloves on. So.